Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our online adult Bible study series, Scripture Night in America. I'm Pastor Steve Wagner here at Trinity Lutheran Church and School in Lombard, Illinois, and it's my privilege to be with you guys once again, um, getting ready for, uh, this will be our first live one here in a couple of weeks with holidays and pandemics and everything else that's been going on, but I'm glad to be back with you. And as usual, we'll be doing the uh, typical drill. We're looking at the Gospel lesson and the Old Testament lesson Sunday, and this coming Sunday will be the second Sunday of the Epiphany season. And so as such, we have an epiphany uh, theme for us tonight. So let's take a look at our theme. Our theme is the revelation of Jesus as God. The revelation of Jesus as God gives us his peace in this life and the life to come. The revelation of Jesus as God gives us his peace in this life and the life to come. So we will be looking at Isaiah 62 for the Old Testament lesson. And our gospel lesson today comes to us from John chapter 2. Now before we dive into the text, it would be a good idea to uh, maybe put a little bit of better, different focus on, uh, on our theme tonight by talking about the season of Epiphany. Um, last December, we went through the season of Advent. Of course, everyone knows that's anticipation of the coming of Jesus. Um, of course, the Christmas uh, festival and the Christmas season, the 12 days of Christmas, was the actual birth of Jesus. And then following uh, the Christmas season is the Epiphany season that leads us up to Ash Wednesday before the start of Lent. Now, what is the Epiphany season all about? Well, the word Epiphany comes from a Greek word, Epiphany, and it literally means a revealing or an opening. In other words, like as in the opening of someone's eyes. So now that you, you are able to see something that you couldn't see before. You're able to understand something that you did not understand before. So epiphany, then the epiphany in the church is the revealing and the understanding of who Jesus is. So the epiphany season is about the revealing of Jesus to be God in flesh. That's why you, you see a lot of miracles in uh, the Epiphany season, because of course those show that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And so our Epiphany theme tonight talks about the revelation of Jesus. That's, that's what Epiphany is about. So tonight this Epiphany, this revelation that Jesus is God, one of the, the benefits it gives us is it gives us his peace, both now and for eternity. All right, so now you are up to speed on Epiphany and our Epiphany-based theme. So we're going to start then with our Old Testament lesson from Epiphany 2. That's Isaiah 62, verses 1 through 5. So let's put that on the screen and get started. For Zion's sake, I shall not keep silent. This is God speaking. For Zion's sake, I shall not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nation shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, sh so shall your God rejoice over you. All right. So let's get into it. 
the first thing you notice right off the bat, it talks about for Zion's sake, for the sake of Zion and Jerusalem, I shall, God is saying, we shall not keep quiet. All right, what's that talking about? Well, um, it's helpful in this passage to understand the mentioning of Zion and Jerusalem, not as specific physical geographic places, but Zion and Jerusalem here in this text are representative of, of what we as Lutherans call the invisible church on earth. Uh, what do we mean by invisible church? Well, in Luther's uh, catechisms, he talked about the visible church and the invisible church. Basically, the invisible church is the collection of all believers in Christ all over the world. We call it the invisible church because it's not anything that the human eye can see. Uh, we're not able to look into other people's minds and hearts and discern the presence of the Holy Spirit or the presence of faith there. Only God can do that. So we as humans can't see the binding together of everyone in Christ, but it certainly is there. And so the invisible church simply means the collection of all believers, the church in terms of the collection of all believers. So Zion and Jerusalem are talking about all of the believers in other words, the church. So for the sake of the church, God is not going to keep quiet, he says. Now, it's great. In talking, when God speaks, God gives his word, both his law and his gospel. And the message that God gives, his gospel saves. So here we start to see our theme. We, God gives us his peace, and we're, here we're talking about the life to come. You talk about peace and the life to come in Isaiah 62 because he's given us his salvation. He's, and he's doing this through the speaking of his word. So if God got silent, no one would be saved. Well, he's saying, I'm not going to be silent. I want everyone saved. And because I'm not silent, people are going to be saved. And that continues on today. God speaks and God works today through the proclamation of his word. And again, that's the primary function of the church. Now then, he, say, he talks about her righteousness. Now this her is the uh, church. And, you know, you'll, you'll notice... Later, as, as this passage was read, and as you'll see in John 3, there's a theme of marriage that's intertwined in both of these texts. And remember, the church is the bride of Christ, um, which we're about to talk about here in a moment. So this her is her righteousness, uh, the, the righteousness of the church. Now, this is not that... The church in and of itself is righteous. It's the righteousness that God has given the church. The church received it through faith. So the righteousness that God has given goes forth as brightness and as a, the salvation as a burning torch. Okay, so... Um, now you see sort of the role and function of the church because the righteousness that they receive through faith through the preaching of the gospel, um, this is that light, dark imagery that you often see in Scripture about G uh, sin being uh, discussed in terms of darkness and Jesus, God's salvation, being the light of the world. So this righteousness that God gives through his gospel will be brightness and a, and a burning torch. It's going to provide light to the darkness of sin in the world. And so this is what the church does. The church receives this salvation 
through the gospel, and then it turns around and provides the salvation to the rest of the world through the preaching of God, him not keeping quiet. God is not quiet in the sense that when his word is preached, he's not quiet. He's doing something. And actually, again, we've said this before, this is happening right now. This is the whole point. <clears throat> this is the whole point of this Bible study. We're not up here, certainly, because I'm very entertaining, because I'm really not all that entertaining. I'm really not all that funny. I'm really not all that great looking. <laughs> it's, this has nothing to do with me whatsoever, thank goodness. It has everything to do with God not keeping quiet. God proclaiming His word of truth to you through the medium of this program. So the proclamation in the gospel and the salvation that comes through it all um, is a light to the world. Nations shall see your righteousness. As a consequence of God's word being preached and people coming to faith, as a consequence of that, the nations, the world, is going to take notice. Um, and this is where it gets kind of sticky because the world watches the church, the world watches the believers in the church, because as soon as they make a claim as, well, we are children of God, and we are, because the Bible says so, well, as soon as we make that claim, the world starts watching. And what God's intention is that the world will see this brightness, Jesus shining forth in our words and our actions. And so when that happens, the world will take notice. Now, what happens also at times, because all of us, uh, not only are we children of God, we're also by nature sinful, so we're going to sin on occasion and when that happens the world of course takes notice of that as well so you have the cynicism the back and forth but the point is that we're talking this so far has been talking about God's word being proclaimed him not being quiet and when that happens there is a brightness that all of the world shall see Now then you get into something different when he starts talking about a new name from the mouth of the Lord. Now that section might have seemed a little strange to you, the way it's worded, and it, it would probably be helpful for you to get another, um, another rehashing of the uh, second commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, or you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, depending on your translation. Um, in 21st century America, that seems kind of weird, because, well, what's the big deal about, what does it mean even to take God's name in vain, or how does one misuse one's name? That's foreign to us, and the reason it's foreign to us is because in biblical times, um, names had sort of a different meaning to society and culture than names do today. Today, names are just very simply a means of identifying. And, you know, when you say Steve Wagner, oh, you're talking about this guy as opposed to Jeff Stebbin, who's a different person. But in biblical times, your name was your identity. Your name defined you as a human being. In fact, if you looked at a lot of those Old Testament names, the meanings were relevant. Adam, for example, in Hebrew means man. Eve is Hebrew for mother of all living. Well, those two things def not only were their name in terms of identification, but it also defined who they were as people. Um, Abraham is Hebrew for father of many people. That defined who he was. Isaac, Hebrew for he laughed. If you remember the story from Genesis at his 
uh, when the news came to Abraham and Sarah, she would conceive. She laughed about it because they were, they were uh, older and didn't think it would happen. They dismissively laughed it off. Uh, Jacob, heel-grabbing deceiver. Israel, which was Jacob's new name, is literally translated, one who wrestled with God and lives. So the point is, names had a meaning. And that means that when you see a name change, as you noticed a couple of times in the Bible, something else is going on. Uh, you, there's been a few name changes. Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. Jacob became Israel. Saul became Paul. Cephas became Peter. Um, in all of those instances, God gave the pe those specific people new names. Well, to us, it's like, okay, he got a new name. But in biblical thought, when God gives you a new name, he's not just giving you a new name, he's giving you a new identity, a new standing before him. All of our identities according to our human nature before we were saved, our identity, our defin our, we, our identity was defined as sinner bound for eternal death. But we have been given a new identity in baptism, and our new identity now is heaven-bound saint. So a name change is akin, in the Bible, is akin to a new identity. So when God gives you a new name, there's something more going on. And so here he's saying, this text says, you're going to be called a new name from the mouth of the Lord. God God's mouth, God personally is giving you a new name, so he's giving you a new identity. And the new name, or excuse me, he didn't quite get to the names yet. He talks about us being a crown of beauty and a royal diadem. Now this is one of many passages... <coughs> that tell us what God thinks of us as people. We are so valued by God that, you know, he sees us the way we would view a precious jewel or a tremendous crown, a diadem, something of tremendous value. Well, this tells you God's attitude towards you and me by virtue of us being baptized into Jesus now we are that precious in the eyes of God. So this is sort of a run on uh, what God thinks of us, which is we're very precious to him. Now we get back into the new names. It says you shall no longer, you and your land will no longer be not uh, forsaken or desolate, And again, you know, well, to us here in 21st century America, no one is named forsaken and no one is named desolate. But again, in biblical thought, your name and your identity, your name and um, your destiny are one and the same. So when he says your name, he really is talking about who we are forsaken and desolate apart from God that's exactly what we would be we would be forsaken no chance at heaven handed over to eternal death and the land would be desolate it would not bear fruit it would not therefore it wouldn't grow food it wouldn't provide there would be no water barren deserts are an, uh, uh, an example of being desolate so he said, no longer are you going to be known this way, because this is how we are by nature. By nature, we are forsaken and desolate, but he's giving us a change of identity. And now it's going to be called, quote, my delight is in her. And the land is going to be called married all right now again that seems a little strange 
but before our identity and our destiny and what described us and defined us as people was forsaken according to our nature once we're saved our identity is my delight is in her that is God's delight is in his church God's delight is in you you are a delight to God that's your new identity that's your new destiny that's your new name that's now how God sees you your reality before was forsaken now your new reality that you are a child of God is that his delight is in you um, and this married, the land was desolate. Now the reality of the land is married. Now remember, um, God's design for marriage is a man and a woman becoming one flesh. And when you become one flesh, that means you are inseparable. So this is to say that God's created people will be inseparable from him. Remember how in Ephesians 5, our relationship with God, or God describes his relationship between Jesus and his church in terms of marriage. Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is the bride of Christ. Because, again, marriage in God's understanding is, is unifying in terms of permanence. So, the institution of marriage as God created it is supposed to point us to and have us understand help us further understand the relationship that we now have with God in Christ Jesus that is inseparable married so when you're talking about married it sounded kind of weird but the idea of course is the fact that us and God the Father, are inseparable because we are held together by Jesus. So all of this is talking about our destiny as God's children, which gives us a permanent place in the eternity of heaven. And then the text ends making a comparison. Just as a bridegroom rejoices over a bride, in the same way God rejoices over you. So on a wedding night, you know, the, the married couple are very happy. The husband, the new husband, is very proud of his new wife. Um, in that, that emotion, according to this verse, that emotion captures or attempts to capture God's feelings for you. If you want to know how special that you personally are to God in Christ Jesus, the specialness that a, new, a newly married wife has in the heart of her newly married husband begins to capture God's feelings for you. All right. Now, I don't have any questions going, so I'm assuming you guys can see me, and I'm assuming you guys can hear me okay. Uh, I know we, we've got quite a few folks. A lot of the regulars are listening, and I thank all of you for doing that. Oh, Robert, right on cue. Pastor, I get verse 5. So shall your sons marry you. I don't... Uh, you know what? Um, I was hoping to gloss over it because it is a little enigmatic, but Robert called me out on it. I read a little bit on it. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And I stumbled through that. I did some reading on it myself, Robert. Um, it's... And I, I'm going to have to say, I don't know that I can fully untangle the mess, but fitting it in with the rest of the context of this passage, theologically speaking, understanding that marriage is simply more to God than a man and a woman getting together and forming a family unit. Marriage is, again, the model for the relationship of Jesus with the church. And so I think if you just stick with that understanding, um, 
because that's what this whole text is trying to say. And I started reading some breakdown of the Hebrew and how perhaps that's not the best interpretation, but the gist of this passage, what it's trying to say, is talking about the joining together of a man or of, of, of people to God in fidelity. Thank you, Louise. All right, Robert, I hope that's helpful. It, it may not be the best explanation, but it's an honest one. <laughs> All right. So, we've got this in mind. Isaiah 62 talks about God saving his people eternally through the preaching of his word, and he brings in marriage as that comparison uh, to uh, talk to us about how our, our permanent connectivity with him. All right, well, now this marriage theme comes out again in John chapter 2 as we are studying in two different parts the wedding at Cana. Um, now, remember our theme again, the revelation of Jesus as God. Again, the revelation of Jesus as God is what Epiphany is all about, the season of. This revelation of Jesus as God gives us his peace, because <coughs> again, we don't have our peace, but we have his peace in this life and the life to come. Now, Isaiah 62 talks greatly about his peace for the life to come, because my goodness, when you talk about us being permanently united to God as, as the way his design for marriage does, can't get any more, that can't give, that can't possibly give any more peace than that knowledge that you are permanently united with God. Now in John chapter 2, what we're going to see is, thank you for the kind words, Mama, I'm glad you and Cheryl joined. <clears throat> what you're going to see is Jesus giving peace for a earthly situation, but he does so pointing towards the fact that we have eternal peace in him. That's what the wedding of Cana is all about. So let's tear into that. <clears throat> and let's take a look at John chapter 2. Verse, first we'll look at verses 1 through 5. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. All right, now there's more sort of weirdness, Robert, for us to chew on, but I think I can adequately talk about this one. Let's hope. All right, so there's a wedding, and it says that the mother of Jesus was there. Obviously, we are talking about Mary. Uh, who the, the virgin that gave birth to Jesus a couple of weeks back at Christmas. So, Mary had a close enough relationship with somebody involved with the marriage somehow, on some level, that she was invited to the wedding. So, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there hanging out at the wedding. And it says that Jesus and his disciples also were invited. Now, you know, either th they also knew the people or maybe they were invited because of Mary. You know, well, you know, we like Mary. Let's invite her son. And I know he's got all of these, um, he's got all these disciples. Uh, who knows? But whatever the, for whatever the reason, Mary, Jesus, and Jesus' disciples are at this wedding and wedding reception. And everything is going well and wonderful until the dreaded news comes of the wine has run out. They're out of wine. They're out of liquor. They're out of booze. Now, again, it's helpful to understand the time and the culture. 
to put this in context. Now, as my mother can attest, she's on, we went to many family weddings and friend weddings growing up. I can't count how many Polish weddings we went to. And um, you'd go to the wedding. They'd have mass in the Catholic Church. The wedding would happen. Then you go to the reception hall, and they wheel in incredible masses amounts of food, incredible amounts of beer, wine, whatever, and they would have a live band, and it... I don't know, church would usually start at 2, it would go to 3, the wedding reception, people would get there at 5, you'd eat at 6, the party would start at 7, and they would go until, I don't know, 11, midnight. What always seemed to happen is when the time came for the band to close, they'd pass the hat, they'd give them more cash, they'd keep playing. And so I remember many of these wedding receptions growing up. And to be sure... If you were at a wedding reception in those days and even today and they ran out of wine, ran out of liquor, there would be a lot of upset people. But this isn't merely about that. Okay? It's not just that, oh, golly, they misjudged how much liquor to buy. In this culture at the time, Running out of wine at a wedding reception was a social blunder of the highest order. It simply wasn't done under any circumstances. It was a supreme insult and a disgrace. Um, if we had run out of beer back at our family wedding receptions back in the day, there would have been a lot of people mad, but we would have drank Dr. Pepper and went on about our business. In this day and age, it, it, it meant something a little more to that. It was just not a good thing ever. Now, I guess if you wanted to, you could sit here and speculate why they ran out of wine. Um, could it be that the bridegroom or his family or whoever was financing didn't have the financial means to fund the amount of wine needed for the party? Could it be that they misjudged how many people came? Who knows? <clears throat> but the problem is they ran out of wine. So, Mary goes to Jesus and says, they have no more wine, we're out of wine. Now this is where it gets a little, you have to unpack a little bit here. Because Mary as a biblical character in the few times but very important times that we're engaged with her as a biblical character Mary always is presented as the model Christian the model of faith uh, you know when she was told as a, as a relatively younger girl hey you're gonna get pregnant by the Holy Spirit and the baby's gonna be the Messiah Savior of the world she handled it with grace. She trusted in God to provide. Um, when the shepherds came in Luke 2 on Christmas to help them celebrate uh, because they had the vision from the angels, Mary, the text says, pondered it in her heart. In other words, she was meditating on the fact that, wow, this really is God here. There's something more going on than me having a simple baby. This isn't no ordinary baby I got. And again, Mary always came off as one of uh, a servant and one of faith. And that's what you see in this text. Mary's coming to Jesus concerned about trying to help out her friends to avoid the scene that would have happened had word got out that they ran out of wine and she came to Jesus for help. Now again, Mary knows that Jesus not only is her son, but she knows that he is the Messiah, God in flesh, and the Savior of the world. And so she's like, hey, can you help us out here? Now, Jesus' response to Mary, to 21st century American ears, might raise some eyebrows. First thing he says, woman... <laughs> in our culture... 
for a son to address his mother as, look, woman, um, that would be extremely disrespectful. But in this case, again, different culture, different time, different meaning, Jesus wasn't trying to, wasn't saying this in a disrespectful manner. Jesus was trying to let her know something. Jesus understands that she's coming to him saying, Hey, God, can you help us out with a little something, something here? We're in a bind. Son, you know, kind of thing, right? I'm your mother and I want you to help us out. Jesus is letting her know that this exchange that they're having isn't going to be in the mother-son dynamic, but this is Lord-disciple. Okay, he wants her to understand. He gets that um, she's wanting help with the situation, and he didn't say he wouldn't help. Okay, but what he's trying to say is, as he helps this, it's not about... He and Mary have different intentions. Mary very simply wants, because she's got the heart of gold that she had, she wanted to help friends out of a tremendous bind. But Jesus is trying to point people to the fact that he is Lord and create faith, like this has all been talking about. So when he addresses her as woman, it's not the disrespectful look woman that we think of, but He's calling her woman instead of mother because he wants her to understand that, okay, for this little exchange, you're my, I'm God and you're my disciple. So let's make sure that, you know, we understand what's going on here. You're trying to accomplish something. And here we talk about giving us peace in this life. This is a real life earth problem. And Jesus is going to help with, but it's not just about fixing the earthly problem. It has to do with life to come. He's going to do this in a way that lets people know, hey, he's claiming to be the Messiah. He really, really is. Now, he says, my hour has not come. And this is how you know that Jesus is thinking more than, <coughs> well, I'm going to help with this problem. Because my hour not coming, he, that is a reference to him going to the cross. His hour him being on the cross was where he would, in fact, secure the fact that he's the Savior. Barb, we are all in the family of the Lord God. Couldn't the running out of wine be symbolizing something else is lacking? Well, it always can, because anytime you leave anything up to human beings, Barb, we're going to mess something up, right? And I suppose that it's fair to make that point, make that point in the very first place. Because if humans didn't need Jesus in the first place, we wouldn't be in this bind. We're in this bind because somebody screwed up and made a human mistake. That's yeah, good, good, good uh, observation. All right, so Jesus is saying, look, my hour hadn't come yet, so um, we're going to do something different here. Now, again, there's a lot of unspoken going on and. You might say, well, you know, you're reading a lot into this, and I don't know, but look at Mary's response. Do whatever he says. Do what he tells you. That is Mary's way of saying, okay, I get it. Now, understand here, this, having this problem averted was important to Mary personally. She's got a personal stake in it. These are people she cares about. She didn't want a scene. Now, notice. And here's where you see Mary being a model of faith. Mary knows that her son is God. She doesn't know exactly how Jesus is going to fix it. She doesn't know the way. She doesn't know the timing. But she doesn't need to know. She's simply willing to trust and believe that when Jesus says he's going, that, that Jesus is going to fix it. And, you know, that line right there, 
would be quite the line for us in our daily lives to meditate on because when we get in a pickle and we start calling on Jesus to fix it, we need to know timing, we need to know how, we need to know the way, we need to know, we need to know. We're not really good at having a handing it to God and say, you know what, fix it however you feel is best because I know what you do is going to be the best. We're not good at that. But that's exactly what Mary is doing here. She's telling the people, look, whatever he says to do, do. In other words, I trust that he's going to get it right. I don't know how. I don't know when. But I'm trusting him so much that whatever he says to do, you guys do. So Mary is also serving in some capacity <clears throat> in helping uh, present this on. Uh, probably as a favor, she's, uh, who knows, maybe she's the uh, best friend of the mother of the bride, and as a favor, she's helping coordinate and helping things happen. You know how that happens. So Mary has, for this f event, a degree of um, authority, and so she says, do what he says, and so we'll see what happens. All right, now let's look at the, re and again, I guess we should take a step back and look at our theme, the revelation of Jesus as God, which we're about to see firsthand, gives us peace in this life. Fixing this problem will give them earthly peace, but there's more to earthly peace to it. What about the life to come? And that's what we're about, to, with all the pieces of the puzzle, are about to come together in this next part so let's look at verses 6 through 11 now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 or 30 gallons <clears throat> Jesus says to the servants fill the jars with water and they filled them up to the brim and he said to them now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast so they took it when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him all right where are we at uh, there okay all right so let's take a look at what we got going on here <clears throat> six stone water jars First off, stone jars in these days were valuable because Levitical law, specifically Leviticus 11.33, said that if anything that was ceremonially unclean fell into, for example, a clay pot, the clay pot had to be broken and destroyed. And you had to get another one. But it said that if something unclean falls into a stone jar it was okay just simply to wash out the stone jar. So stone jars were valuable because they could simply just be cleaned out. You didn't have to throw them out in case it came in contact with anything ceremonially unclean. So that's good. And it said that they were there for the Jewish rites of purification. Now again, it's helpful to understand that even though this is the New Testament, this is the Gospels, at this point, and, and actually until the death of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection on Easter, they are still operating religiously under Old Testament law. So, if you know Old Testament law, this you'll get this. If you don't, Basically, 
<clears throat> in the Old Testament, to obtain forgiveness from God, God had established this whole sacrificial system to happen. Um, you know, you'd sacrifice this or that for this or that offense. Uh, you would also offer up burnt offerings and all sorts of offerings. That would include sacrificial rituals. And as part of the ritual of sacrifice to obtain God's forgiveness for sins, <clears throat> everyone and everything involved had to go through a purification process. There was a ceremonial washing of the hands of the priest. There was a ceremonial washing of all of the utensils that were going to be used. Which, by the way, is exactly why um, baptism, as Jesus ordained it in, um, in the New Testament, wasn't a completely foreign concept to Old Testament Jewish folks because... There was a ceremonial washing that was done as part of their religious life back then. The difference was back then, in the Old Testament, the ceremonial washing was the removal of physical dirt, whereas baptism is the removal of spiritual dirt, i.e. sin. But that's what this is for. They had these big stone jars that they used water and that was what they used for the ceremonial purification cleansing before the sacrifices at the worship services. So they got their hands on six of those. And it says each of them was 20 or 30 gallons. So these things are big. <clears throat> now, you might ask... Do you really need that much wine? Well, two things. Number one, in some of the big wedding receptions I went to as a kid, yeah, you could. Um, but more importantly, number two, um, in these days, a wedding reception, a festival of celebration wasn't one night. It went on for a full week. People would shut down businesses and not go to work and party for a week to express that much joy and celebration over the marriage of a man and a woman. That was just Jewish custom. So they're going to need a lot of wine because this is going to go on for a while. Um, so Jesus tells them, fill the jars with water. Now again, there's more than meets the eye here. Because in these days, obviously you needed a lot of wine because you had to feed people for a week and you couldn't run out and that could be expensive. So the trick they used back then, a really cheap way <clears throat> to get wine in front of people was they would take they would take like low quality, thick, clumpy wine and mix it with water to dilute it. So you could, you could turn a little bit of wine into a lot of wine by just diluting it with water. And that's what they would do. Well, Jesus says, fill them up. Not just, they, they would have been used to hearing, well, fill it up half with wine or half with water, or three or two-thirds with water, and then we'll go get the other stuff and mix it up. He's going to go all the way to the top with water. There, he wants them, he wants to make the point that unlike the normal custom, there will be nothing in these vats but water. 100% water. They filled them to the brim. So one, they honored Mary's directive to do whatever he tells you to do. And again, what he's telling them to do would not make sense to them in this day and age. But they did it anyways. And they filled it all the way to the very tip top. There was no room for not, not another drop of water in these things. So there was only water. And then he says, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast.
draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. Master of the feast was kind of like the person in charge of the party. Uh, you know, I guess in our culture, that would be like the head of the catering company or, you know, the wedding planner or whoever was making sure that everything that was supposed to happen would happen. So Jesus says, take some to him. Now, one, the head guy in charge and probably the guy who was the most stressed out about the fact that they don't have any more wine, I got to figure this out, would be really happy to be presented with a glass of wine. See, we're not out after all. And two, this gives the servants the opportunity to firsthand witness an actual miracle of God. Okay, so he, they don't exactly know what's happening now. He said, look, take a cup of water of it. Take a cup of that water. Take it to the dude. Okay, again, whatever Mary said to do what he says, so we're just going to do what he says. Here, let's go, whatever. And so they take it to him. But on the way, the text says the water turned into wine. Water becomes wine. Obviously, no other explanation possible than it was simply a miracle. And this is, in fact, the first chronologically first recorded miracle of Jesus in his ministry as the Savior. Now, the text said the master didn't know where it came from, but the servants knew because they're the ones who filled it to the top with water. They're the ones who drew the water out, so they knew. The servants knew. <clears throat> they realized, and by knowing, okay, we filled it up with water. We know it was because we did it. We're the ones who took the cup of the water, so we know it was water when we pulled it out, yet now the guy's drinking wine. Obviously, this is a miracle, and obviously it had something to do with this Jesus guy. So they realized that they had just seen a miracle from God. Now think about this. The servants in their pecking order of the time would have kind of been uh, not very important people. But Jesus loves even the lowly servants. They weren't lowly to him. He loves the lowly servants enough to reveal himself to them as God, because only God could make this miraculous thing happen. It is a miracle, Louise. Now look at the response. It's kind of funny. Everyone usually serves the good wine first. <clears throat> so the trick back then, again, you know, you got to provide enough wine for a lot of people for seven days. That took a lot of wine. So they were always cutting corners. And we told you how the trick was to uh, dilute bad, clumpy wine with water. And I'm going, it's not the highest quality, but the trick was they would have good quality wine out first. People would drink a few. And then once people had drunk enough, then they'd bring out the cheap stuff because after a few drinks, people either wouldn't notice the change in quality or wouldn't care. Um, that's the trick. And he's like, whoa, you're doing it different. You brought out the good stuff second. Wow, this is great. And so it also tells you, you have kept the good wine until now. The master noticed that the wine from Jesus was top quality. Jesus doesn't halfway do stuff. If Jesus is going to do it, it's going to be the best. So if Jesus is going to make wine, he's not going to make Mad Dog 2020. He's going to make, you know, Dom Perignon. You know, he's going to make the good stuff. Because everything Jesus does is the best. All right. 
So, let, what does all of this mean? Let's put the pieces of the puzzle together. <clears throat> Oh, actually, I left a couple of parts off. It said, and this is worth mentioning. Let me put the text back on. I did have a couple of other things I wanted to talk about. It said that this was the first of his signs. The text didn't call this a miracle. The text called this a sign. There's a difference. A miracle is... You know, something outlandish and unbelievable and incredible that, that happens. But it says this is a sign because this wasn't just simply a miracle for the sake of miracles because Jesus doesn't do miracles. Jesus doesn't put on a show. Jesus was trying to show people, hey, I really am God. That's Jesus, of every miracle he performed, he had two motivations, proof and mercy. One, he wanted to help people out of a problem, which is what happened here. But two, he wanted to prove that he truly was God. He didn't expect you to just randomly believe it because he said so. He's willing to show it. And number two, it says that his disciples believed in him. So the miracle, the sign, worked. It created faith. Seeing this happen created faith in a lot of people. <clears throat> His disciples knew it. The servants knew it. And so that either created and or strengthened faith in him. Oh, this guy really is God. Dude, I just saw him turn water into wine. He must be God like he claims. All right, so now. Let's put all of this together. Here's our summary. The season of Epiphany is about Jesus revealing himself to us to be God in flesh, like we said. And the text tonight show us that as Jesus reveals himself as God in flesh, we receive his peace, <clears throat> not only in earthly situations, but forevermore, because here in John 2, he he addressed an earthly problem, but he did so in a way that created faith, which gives you eternal peace. In the Old Testament lesson from Isaiah 62, we see God's attitude towards us, which is one of love and so much love that he secures for us eternal life. And the gospel lesson today from John 2 at the wedding of Cana, we have the wedding theme again that was prevalent here. It's also prevalent here. <coughs> And we show people coming to Jesus with an earthly need, but Jesus addresses it in a way that points them to the fact that he is the Savior of all sin. Jesus is God, and God wants you to be saved and to be his child, and that happens through the work and the person of Jesus. And he reveals the fact that he is God to us today. All right. Good stuff tonight. Glad to be back on live with all of you again. Um, look for us again next Wednesday, uh, January 19th. We'll be back again at 6 p.m. Central with another live edition. And uh, look for us again Sunday morning as usual at 9, <coughs> at 9 a.m. Central Time for a live-streamed worship service from our sanctuary here in Lombard. So I thank all of you for joining us today. I pray that uh, you enjoyed the lesson. Hopefully you learned a little something. And most importantly, that you grew in your walk with the Lord. So I thank you for watching. Please share our videos with other people, with your friends. Tell others about us. And I pray that the Lord would richly bless your evening.